That's true, Dr. Zayas. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know. How's it going, Higher Side Chatters? Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke, doing it the way I think it should be done. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and we know that all around us is a carefully crafted reality conjured up by the sorcerers of social engineering aimed at shoehorning society into passionless careers as cogs in the nefarious elite's money-making machines, but what are we going to do about it? We see that our self-sufficiency and natural instinct has been stripped away in exchange for a nation of teat-suckling adult babies for the powerful system. But how do we unravel the mess and move forward? Well, it's much more effective to attack the root of the control tree than spend your time hacking at the various branches. And where it all starts for me is the mighty education machine. And one of the biggest names in the fight against that machine is the highly respected and decorated teacher turned whistleblower, John Taylor Gatto. While John's writing and words have woken many and inspired even more, his health has made lengthy interviews difficult in recent years. But lucky for us, John doesn't fight alone. So with us today is David J. Rodriguez, the publisher of John's epic 400-plus page Beacon of Light entitled The Underground History of American Education. He is also the founder of the Education Options Expo, which is an event where parents are introduced to respectable schools and approaches to learning, and where they hear from leaders who are demonstrating the future of education today. A champion of progress and a man of the people, David, my man, welcome to THC. Hey, Greg. Great to be with you, and very happy to have an exciting conversation for the benefit of your listeners. Well said, man, and thanks so much for doing this. This is such a key issue, and if the people want to educate themselves on anything conspiratorial, forced schooling really is the most important thing because its effects are so widespread, and you don't need to speculate because all these plans are very well documented, aren't they? They are. They've listed them from various philosophers back to Plato and all the way up through Machiavelli, uh, Johann Fichte in Germany, Wilhelm Wundt from Germany as well. I mean, a lot of folks have put it out, then they realize the young people are so moldable and easy to form that if they can just indoctrinate them with their theories and value systems, then it's really hard to come out from that. And so that's why William James said that habit is the flywheel of society and it keeps the wealthy kids away from the poor kids because of habits. And it has been recognized for hundreds and thousands of years. And now we're starting to see it come to fruition here. And it's a really a testament to the work of John Taylor Gatto to dig up these resources and I mean, this is in a time when the internet wasn't around. And so he went to the libraries and looked at the stacks and um, original documents there from the libraries and sending off various requests for these books and manuscripts. And it is, it's definitely well documented. Right. And that's one of my favorite parts about this particular study because. There At the time, in the early 1900s, there were a lot of people who even wrote about what was going on. This one thing I wrote down here, this quote, was from Bernerman Kidd in 1918. He wrote, The chief end was to impose on the youth the ideal of subordination. At first, the primary target was the tradition of independent livelihoods in America. Unless Yankee entrepreneurship could be extinguished, the immense capital that mass production industry required wasn't justifiably viable. So students were trained to think of themselves as employees competing for the favor of management. I mean, boom, that's what school is right there. It really is. And that was what's so unique about America is that it was started by a bunch of either former slaves or involuntary servitude slaves and people who left Europe or left wherever continent they came from for a chance at freedom, generally religious freedom. And they got out here, and there's no authorities telling them what to do. And so they had to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and make the churches and make the homes and make the agricultural. And really, you had to do it or it was not going to get done. And so that created a strong society of people who are self-reliant, independent. And as uh, Great Britain started to realize what 
was happening to their colonies, they said, man, we got to get rid of this, like you said, Yankee entrepreneurialism mm -hmm. because in Great Britain, it was a class system and it was the, the monarchy and you essentially had the elite and you had the underclasses. And so now you have this burgeoning middle class of people where you can create your life if you have the courage to go out and, and do so. And if you're in a, the colonies at that time, you had the courage because you had to cross the Atlantic yeah. in a, a huge ship and it was you're putting your life at risk. Whereas today you can just fly over there six, seven, eight hours and easy to transport. But yeah, the independent self-reliance was a big problem for the monarchy and for controlling the masses. Right. And that is a good point that this type of schooling had been rolled out in other areas before. It was rolled out through Europe. We routinely hear that it came from Prussia, which of course is where Germany is. So the study of it in America is just great because it is the latest iteration of it. And the, all the documents kind of show what they were trying to do. There's even a quote here from uh, Woodrow Wilson in 1917, where he actually said, the president said, we want one class of people to have a liberal education and another class of people, a much larger group, to forego that and learn specific, difficult manual tasks. I mean, clearly they just want people to be cogs in the wheel. You can't really mask it any, any better than that. But uh, before we get too far into this, I hope you could talk to us a little bit about John Taylor Gatto and his story. It's pretty powerful, and he's been such a key whistleblower in this that it deserves a little bit of attention, I'd say. Yes, John Taylor Gatto is probably the foremost voice in authentic education today, meaning not compulsory education. He taught eighth grade for 30 years in New York City and received the State Teacher of the Year Award twice and the City Teacher of the Year Award three times. And he's spoken in all 50 states, usually at homeschool conventions, sometimes for Muslim groups, Christian groups. He's spoken in nine countries about a respectable learning, primarily homeschooling, because what he speaks about is that the, the compulsory nature of the system is its Achilles heel. So if we can address that in, in this conversation and going forward in our lifetime, uh, this institution really is not going to be around much longer. So he had uh, some incredible students who did great things. And what he said is that I realized teaching was an art, but it wasn't an art like painting where I would put these various colors on a blank canvas. It was more like sculpting where there's already a image inside the marble, let's say. And my job was to just help remove little pieces that were blocking this beautiful image from showing itself. And a lot of it was getting out of the kid's way and just helping them kind of identify what their interests were and then letting them free. And he termed, he came up with a term, open source learning, where he says that teaching is not a profession. Teaching is a function and anything can become your teacher. So with these types of ideas, imagine in the you know, very liberal New York City schools, he was not welcomed by his staff members. Mm -hmm. And he even said he was a saboteur and he worked to kind of create this persona of himself. He would wear three piece suits to school and yell at kids in the hallway and was really kind of a big figure in the school. But he did that so that people would not mess with him. And he could actually work with the uh, students. And if some of your listeners want to see this in action, he has a great documentary for free on YouTube. Just search Classrooms of the Heart, and you can see him in action for about 20 minutes. And you can get a, a taste of what he was doing. And it's very inspirational. But he is one of the, like I said, most important voices in education. And we're going to be working to get in this workout for the next year or two and hopefully you know, make a film here in the coming years. So. It's, it's that important. Yeah, Trojan horse teaching. I love it. And uh, I think one of the quotes I've heard from John when he came out and started whistleblowing about this is, I don't want to hurt kids to make a living any longer. And that is a real profound statement. And I had some other quotes that would kind of grease the wheels for this conversation about education. Another one that I loved that he said was, grades don't measure anything other than your relevant obedience to a manager. Again, it 
driving home that point that we're just bred to suck up to authority. Another good one, this is kind of key, is children learn what they live. Put kids in a class and they will live out their lives in an invisible cage, isolated from their chance at community, interrupt kids with bells and horns all the time, and all they will learn is that nothing is important or worth finishing. Ridicule them and they will retreat from human association. Shame them and they will find a hundred ways to get even. These habits taught in large-scale organizations are deadly. And these are the things we teach our kids. Eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. I mean, that alone gets you ready for the nine to five soul-sucking reality you're going to have from cradle to grave. But yeah, it's it's he, he's a great guy with amazing quotes and he says it better than I can, but it is a serious problem. Yeah, and one of the reasons he's one of the most quoted folks in the homeschool world is because he has the courage to speak what he sees, and he's not a politically correct. What he's concerned about is the minds of the young people. He also said that genius is as common as dirt, and that there's inside of us this ability, and if we're able to just um, allow ourselves to kind of be free and explore it. He documents so many stories of people who have achieved success without the traditional, quote, degrees and diplomas. And as you probably well know, these degrees and diplomas are useless <laughs> and meaningless for real productive work. And he demonstrates that by saying, when was the last time you asked your barber, your accountant, your engineer, whoever the professional person you're working with, when it was the last time you asked them for their SAT scores, for their GPA, for their high school diploma? And he said, have you, have you even thought about doing it? You haven't mm -hmm. because we know deep down they're useless and they're not real. And if you want to know if your barber is a good professional at cutting hair and making you look good, you look in the mirror and you say, okay, you know, this is a nice haircut. The grades don't measure that. And you also mentioned the, the importance of habits. Man, when we are spending 12 years listening to bells every 40 minutes, as he mentioned, we learn that nothing's worth starting because we can't finish it. And we learn that somebody else will give us the assignment and then they will evaluate us and they will approve of us or they won't approve of us. And in terms of the original colonies and the, back when this country first began, you evaluated yourself and you said, okay, does this product work? Does this field yield fruit? Whatever the, the event that you're doing. And so realizing that self-reliance, self-evaluation is the key. And he brought that to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree more. And to get us into the history a little bit, one more quote I wanted to read from, from John's is, this was once a land where every sane person knew how to build a shelter, grow food, and entertain one another. Now we have been rendered permanent children. It's the architects of forced schooling who are responsible for that. And man, touche, that's powerful stuff. But let's elaborate a bit on the history there. Knowing how this was all set up is pretty crucial. So as far as the American school system is concerned, when and how did all this kind of get started? The first year that compulsory attendance laws were passed was 1852 in Massachusetts. And the political spearhead behind it was Horace Mann. And he was uh, very ambitious. And he went and visited the Prussian facilities. And the reason is because they had a, a, an army that was obedient and uh, they were able to control the the actions of their soldiers. And they said, how are you guys doing that? We need to control society. And so they went and learned how they were indoctrinating their students. And it was drilling and habit forming. And the three R's, which we hear so common is reading, writing, and arithmetic was not part of the situation. It was actually expressively to create public opinion, to have elites uh, manipulate the society, and they would use the indoctrinated classes to basically be their human resources. 
And that's where it originated from. And as I mentioned before, it goes back for hundreds and even thousands of years of philosophers realizing that if we can, you know, with their evil, sinister voices, if we can just get our kids, right, get the kids, <laughs> then then they can, you know, control the future. And they said that, you know, that the what we are teaching our kids will be the future adults. Right. And so, yeah, it came from Prussia, Germany. And because it benefits the state, the state naturally wants to grow their power. And if they can pull away the kids from their parents, now they can indoctrinate them with whatever values and attitudes and habits that would benefit the state. And what's interesting is that when compulsory education first began, it was only three months out of the year, and it was from eight, age nine to 12 years old. Hmm. So it's this incrementalization, just like the income tax was, where they say, okay, we're just going to be a little, you know, three months out of the year, and then you can have your kids help you on the farm. And little by little, they expanded the time and had eight, younger ages and older ages and now they want to have compulsory preschool and it's just remarkable what they're doing and what i would say to parents now is you know understand that the state has its motives and you have its motives and so you want to share your values of the family with your kids the state has its own values and there's no real restraint in what they want to do and the great analogy is if, imagine that mcdonald's was in charge of the school system what would they be indoctrinating the kids in? Will they be sharing, hey, here's the, you know, here's all the cartoon characters on the wall and we can pledge allegiance to the to the M and we can, you know, look at these great products and food is great for us when in reality it's not, you know. Right. There's, you know, documentaries to, uh, to show the uh, fast food nation the negative effects of it there. But the point is, is that whoever's controlling the curriculum and the assignments in the system would naturally have a, a large influence on their development. So this is what the what the state wants to do. And naturally, it's uh, going towards more collectivism because this benefits the state and increased taxes and decrease freedoms and personal respect for the person. And this is the uh, kind of the origins. Mm -hmm. I love that McDonald's analogy, man. That's pretty good. And Two names I hear a lot about in the early days of getting this thing set up are Rockefeller and Henry Ford. And it's funny because almost everyone I know has uh, has negative feelings about the Rockefeller family, but a lot of people have huge respect for Henry Ford. But he's the one who reduces us to screw tighteners on an assembly line, you know? I mean, he was really just as big a part of this as anybody at the time, wasn't he? He was, yeah. And he is famous for saying, I want to a nation of workers. I don't want a nation of thinkers. <laughs> and the reason is that if you have a nation of thinkers, then are they going to buy your products? Are they going to simply accept what you tell them is the truth? Or are thinkers, critical thinkers, are they going to actually doubt what you have to say and maybe create a product that competes with your product or recommend other alternatives to what you're suggesting and they understood that if you cannot think critically then you're going to buy the product and they also as you mentioned they needed factory workers so if you do have a employee would you want an employee that accepts your orders verbatim or do you want one that eh, maybe he'll do your bidding today maybe tomorrow he'll you know disagree with you and <laughs> create a little Right within the lab laborers there and mm -hmm. create some dissent. No, you want somebody who's going to accept what you tell them to do, period. And that's what they had in mind for their manufacturing facilities and the consumption of their products. So it is the, the four foundation, Carnegie, Rockefeller all had interests because they're big money and they're, they have their interests, which would be maintaining their influence and a consumption of their products and goods. And what uh, Rockefeller said was that competition is a sin. <laughs> so they have the idea of complete monopolization and a social order towards internationalization and a world order. You know, these folks 
want to create a, a global state where everybody is the same and if you dissent, you're frowned upon and not received. Whereas in the earliest parts of this country, dissent was expected if you're a citizen to speak your voice. And this is why freedom of speech is, is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know all that too well. I got kicked out of private school just for uh, being rebellious. There's everybody asks, well, what'd you get kicked out for? And really, there isn't a actual you know, thing I can cite except, well, it's a private school. They didn't like my rebellious nature. And so they just said, get out of here. And uh, that's what happened. But I'm reading a lot more than I typically do in an interview. But I wanted to read another paragraph here that not only gives us some of the names we need, but also talks about these foundations. And I think people get confused because they equate these foundations with being charitable, which uh, really isn't the case. But here we go. No one amassed more wealth more quickly than J.D. Rockefeller through his oil interests. In the early 1900s, he amassed the equivalent of $663 billion in today's dollars. Other industrialists created great wealth for themselves also, with legendary names like J.P. Morgan, Carnegie, Mellon, Guggenheim, Vanderbilt, Peabody, and Ford. Today we know them by the foundations they created, totaling over $550 billion in today's dollars, and by their vast corporate holdings and businesses like Chase Bank, Ford Motor Company, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller Center, Carnegie Hall, etc. With their incredible sudden wealth also came enormous tax bills. Their solution was to create for themselves with the help of bought politicians, tax-exempt nonprofit organizations or NGOs. In 1900, there were 21 corporate NGOs, and by 1990, some 50,000 had spawned. Through their creation of the NGOs, not only could they shelter wealth, but also be able to develop a new science called scientific social engineering to influence federal, state, and local politicians and the public at large for their own wishes, desires, and needs. I mean, you don't have to do much speculation. It seems pretty obvious when you hear that. <laughs> Correct. They, you, they understand that taxes would eat away at their wealth so that if they can have a front of charity and public good similar to the the uh, clinton foundation right you know, they, they're under some scrutiny now as well where the speeches and donations are not going to charitable goods and so yeah this is a a way that the big money is able to do that and not pay taxes and just have huge reservoirs of cash and capital and influence is naturally you can buy off you know, any person generally. Every person has a price. <laughs> and so when you have this type of money – and what's also interesting is they have prestige because they – many folks do not know about this type of background and initial insight into their intentions. And so it is. You see these great events. You have Carnegie Hall. You have various fronts, and that actually occurred because – Rockefeller was getting some bad publicity, and so he had some PR guys and like Edward Bernays and Ivy Lee back in the, the early 1900s, and he they suggested perhaps you should you know have some positive and good light public relation news, and so that's what they started to do is make these these contributions and uh, foundations to appear good and. Carnegie is actually famous for Andrew Carnegie for donating a not a piano but the an organ to many churches around the nation, and so he would give these organs to the churches for free, and so that just creates this goodwill from the churches, and who knows, maybe they'll give us some more down the road. So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, we'll keep them in good light, and you know they got a lot of money, and they're just a good organization. And so this is the the dichotomy of these foundations is that sometimes they actually do some good work or at least surface work. And then on the underside, they're funding compulsory education. And even, you know, they get into the medical field and just start to you know, convolute the true health. And this is a different topic, but they're, they're, they're all widespread and they're generally not positive for the average person, but they do serve their own personal interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. They have a charitable PR front, but then on the back end, on the underground, they're doing things uh, to suit their needs. I mean, it's it's kind of a common thing, but this was obviously 
about a 200 year saga. And most of the guys who set this up have died out, but uh, all of them, if it's 200 years, but uh, (laughs) these foundations are alive and well. And are they very involved with the school system today? They are. And the, Probably most prominent one today is the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation. Mm, and course. they, yeah, they have been funding the creation of the Common Core curriculum. And for any of the listeners who want a good chuckle, if they're, you know, have a little bit of humor, go to YouTube and type in two plus two equals five. And you'll see a representative of Common Core saying, Well, if they can explain in words how they got five, two plus two can equal five, then yes, they would get it marked correct. And so this is just one example of how horrible the curriculum has come where you you think you're learning something in school and they come off with these great names, no child left behind. And reality is that when you force somebody to learn something or you force anybody to do anything, there's this natural resistance. And by forcing somebody, you actually are disrespecting their rights as a person. And that's why I believe the forced schooling system is one of the most heinous organizations on earth because it does that. And it's not to go after the teachers. So if you're a teacher out there, understand you're part of a victim as well. The students are victims. The teachers are victims because nobody explained this to you. And I have family members who are either retired teachers or current teachers and principals. They're great people. I love them. And when you join the school system, you, you want to help kids. I want to become a teacher. It's a respected profession. And in the heart of it is the word pedagogy from the Latin root pedagogis which you can look up, but the, the, the term comes from a slave. The, the pedagogue was not the creator of the curriculum, but a deliverer of the curriculum from the master. So the master creates the curriculum and the pedagogue delivers the content to the student. So this is quite alarming to understand that if you really want to be helpful in the student's learning, Then you want to inquire of them. And this is also the root word of education, educo, to draw from within, to elicit, rather than trying to, as I gave the painting analogy, you're trying to remove what's blocking it, to draw from within. There's already this genius inside of us. And that's also what Buckminster Fuller said. He had a great quote. It said, every child's a born genius, but they get degeniused trying to please their teachers and please their parents. So you just want to be aware of the uh, school system itself and that when you force people to learn, you're actually not getting real learning and you can cause a lot of resentment. So as a uh, Gata would say, don't become you know, your child's teacher, become their partner, you know, their learning partner and find something that they're excited about and uh, cut them loose so they can go out and, and pursue it for themselves. Mm-hmm. Well said. And I agree with your point about teachers. You know, there's a lot of people trying to do good. They want to educate children. So this is the only way they know to try to do it. And they dedicate their lives. And it is a noble effort. But, you know, I, there's also probably some good cops out there, too. But the criminal justice system is a complete mess. And, you know, it's hard to do good when you're kind of a soldier in a system that is oppressive, but this is, these are the choices we, we have in this kind of society that is tightly gripped by these corporate elite. Yes. And I wanted to ask you for a lot of people, this system of schooling is all we know. So the idea that you could just remove it sounds pretty scary. John also talks about in the book, how the system drives us to look at other people in society as unruly and reinforces the mindset that people need to be regulated. Help us unravel that myth. Even if it is not a great system, how do we know we'd be okay without it completely? Yeah, the crutch of the system is compulsory attendance laws. And the reason that's so important is because it's state funded and the state gets their funds based on attendance laws. So if you ever heard of someone being a truant or a truancy officer, They're out trying to find these kids to put them in school because on their attendance rosters, they got to check 
attended school today because if they don't have a certain level of attendance, they lose funding. Hmm. So when you understand that the schools get paid off of attendance, then when you begin withdrawing your kids from the school system, this will inevitably reduce their funding and reduce their size and scope. So in in the beginning of this country's founding, there were schools, but they weren't compulsory. And they were allowing many different ages of students to mix with each other. And it was something that the students would want to do or the parents would encourage them to do. Whereas the system we have today, you have no choice because if you don't show up, you'll become a truant and you'll get letters and fines and potentially uh, spend some time in jail because the, the state believes that they own your child and have some type of parenting responsibilities. And it's, it's really the, the, the core part of it is the compulsory attendance law. So what Gatto says is that if you make attendance voluntary in five years, you'll have some really interesting schools pop up. And within 10 years, you'll have some of the most innovative options and alternatives and respectful schools in existence. So when he said in 10 years, just by making attendance voluntary, there'll be a, a positive and major impact. But there are schools that have been around. There's a school called Summerhill in the UK. It's been around for over 90 years. You can watch a movie about it on YouTube for free. And there's no compulsion. And some of the students have become engineers and architects and scientists and professors and authors, just great, impactful professions, giving value to mankind. And the philosophy of the school is this. If they don't want to take classes, because they do have optional classes, then they don't have to take classes. They can play all day. And you'll see an interview. Last name is Neil, N-E-I-L-L. And he said, when you give a child freedom, they'll play and play. But then at some point, they get this internal spark and motivation that they want to learn something. And so they will actually begin exploring and they will become uh, adventurers and people that want to uh, look into stuff, read into different subjects, which the most powerful motivation there is is self-motivation. Otherwise, you're a a cog in a wheel or a slave of a master and you're told to do it. And so you got to do it. Otherwise you're going to be whipped or, you know, punished. And that's not how the human spirit flourishes. The human spirit flourishes under freedom and liberty and in a respectful environment, the a student becomes a great intellectual and just a really remarkable options do exist. So I don't think we're trying to, remove the system tomorrow, but the conversation and what I'm up to with my Education Options Expo is to show parents that there are respectful models out there. There's a lot of people concerned with schools. So rather than trying to bang our heads against the wall and say, oh, this political institution, which it is, is not listening to us, which it doesn't, what can we do about it? Just be resigned. No, the reality is that there are phenomenal options available today and they're all based on voluntary attendance which means you can go or not uh, you can do homeschool and there's a lot of solutions which have proven records and you don't have to be stuck in the current state of school there's actually a lot of hope and there won't be too much resistance from kids the resistance actually comes from parents and the state, which uh, gets the financial rewards by their attendance. Hmm. And I concur. And I like this part of the book where John uses the example of driving to try to dispel a lot of the myths around learning and this need for regulation, because driving is so important. It really is a life and death issue. And everyone learns to drive really in a matter of hours. And then they're kind of out on their own for the rest of their life. And yes, we have accidents, but it's a really small fraction when you consider all the drivers on the roads. And not only that, but gasoline. He mentions that five gallons of gas is as explosive as a stick of dynamite. But anyone 
can get it without signing anything or showing ID. And yet we don't have widespread problems with people using it for destructive purposes. So it does make for a great example for multiple reasons. When you think about, well, do we really need this schooling? You know, is it going to be complete chaos if we just let people do what they want to do? Well, no, because here in the example of driving, you have several reasons why people can be okay on their own and there isn't widespread chaos. I'm so glad you brought that up, Greg, because I love that essay also, The Art of Driving. And he does. He mentions that three gallon, or excuse me, five gallons of gas is one stick of dynamite. So if you're driving in a car with 15 gallons of gas, you effectively are driving around with three sticks of dynamite. And you take a 10 hour, 20 hour practice course and driving, and then you're driving on the road. You can, get, you can go out there and kill people or kill yourself. And it's such a, a demonstration that when the state wants to allow certain things, they allow it because you know, our society depends a lot on people being able to drive to the store, being able to drive to schools, being able to you know, uh, transport themselves. And this skill of, of driving is so important. And if they block that, you know, they would block a lot of their uh, you know, corporate profits. But it is the art of driving and what it would mean if we couldn't drive uh, would be uh, quite a, a negative impact on the economy. And so just think about that. You're driving. You have this potential explosion in your vehicle, mm -hmm. but you didn't have to go through some you know, years of practice. Literally, you can learn, as you mentioned, just in a few hours. And some of the nuances you'll pick up later, but there's a funny story John talks about when he learned to drive. I believe he was uh, 11 or 12 years old, <laughs> and, and his uncle said, okay, Johnny, you're going to learn to drive today. And John just said, man, I was so fearful. And he said, here's what you do. The rectangle pedal goes forward. The pedal on the left stops. When you want to turn left, you turn left. When you want to turn right, you turn right. That's it. That's all you need to know. Let's go. You're getting in the driver's seat. <laughs> <laughs> Experience is the best teacher. Absolutely. So just the um, the truth is that stuff we are able to learn easily if we believe we can. And so this is what is also known as learned helplessness is after we learn from, quote, experts that we need their approval, we need their permission. And if we make a mistake, that's bad. We start to cripple our minds to block us so that we don't even try anything. And the example, which is a, a fact, how elephants are trained, you might know about this. In the circus, you have a baby elephant who has their leg chained to a post. And the baby elephant tries to pull the, the chain and they're, they're trying really hard. And at some point, they give up and they conclude, I can't break this chain. Well, the elephant becomes huge. And now the elephant is tied to the stake with a rope. But it's, you know, thousands of pounds. And then when the elephant starts to pull his leg, he feels that resistance and it triggers his memory that, oh, I tried when I was a kid and I can't break this chain. So this is called learned helplessness when in reality the elephant is very powerful and can easily just break the rope, break the stake and go on a rampage and be free. But he learned from his previous conditioning that uh, he cannot do that. So in the same way, our minds are conditioned from a young age. And one of the parts of schooling, which is really offensive and damaging, and even I'm unlearning and you know, your listeners probably understand too, that failure is actually one of the greatest things in the learning process. As you mentioned, yes. experience. Hey, when you experience something, whether it's a business or a project or a relationship, whatever it might be, and you fail, if you can sit sit down afterwards and actually reflect upon it and say, what happened? Okay, and, and, and think about it. You can learn a lot versus the school system, which teaches you that six out of 10 is failure. When in the business world, if you can get six out of 10 right, you become a massive success. And <laughs> in the baseball world, three out of 10, uh, hit, getting a hit puts you in the Hall of Fame. So, yeah, our, uh, our understanding has been definitely convoluted. 
And the reality is we, we can't learn anything if we're uh, given that opportunity. Right. And another important angle to this topic that I hadn't even thought about much, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, was the infantilization of adults, like creating adult babies, increasing the age of dependence, and putting off adulthood. Talk to us about this piece of the puzzle a little bit. Yeah. What John talks about is the extension of childhood and that adolescence had never existed before in history because it was a made up term by educational psychologists. And what he says is that by the time you're seven, you're ready to take on some responsibility. And he said, by the time you're 12, uh, if you're still thinking you're a kid, you know, you're going to have some troubles in life. Mm -hmm. So the reason they want to do to uh, extend childhood and the infantilization of kids is because it's, they're easier to manage. And so that's why you have college students or young people today, 20, 25, 30, 35, perhaps still looking for their purpose, looking for their dream. And I understand because nobody asked me that question. I have a, a business degree and that that's not the question that they ask you, you know, about the meaning of life and mm -hmm. kind of have some philosophical conversation, which is so important, but they teach you that consumerism is your way to happiness. And what uh, John also talks about is the schools create incomplete human beings. So when you are uh, have an extended childhood, you seek approval from other authorities and if they don't, don't approve, then that actually affects your state of mind, your emotions. At, whereas an adult, independent individual, self-reliant, understands, yes, you do want to be respectful to people and you do want to have trust with people. But at the end of the day, it's what you think about you. It's what uh, Michael Jackson would call a man in the mirror, mm. right? If you make the world a better place, take a look at that guy. And he's the guy that can give you a raise, that can help open up doors for you. And so, yeah, the extended infantilization is for managerial benefit and for the corporate benefit as well. That, you know, you want to buy, you know, the iPhone 5 and 6 and 7 and 9 and 10 because, you know, you think that next, that next version or that next edition is going to fulfill you. And I, I think iPhone's a great phone, you know, and Android's a great phone. But understanding the uh, philosophy behind that is continually to replenish that emptiness that you feel w w when in reality, the only way you can feel that is the internal capital, the internal satisfaction. And this can come from your individual growth, from your experience, your adventure, and understanding that you're the one who makes the meaning for your life, not to these corporate entities out there. Well said. And yeah, planned obsolescence, another big component of the American system. But I, another aspect to the creating adult babies thing is child labor laws. They tie into this. And it's kind of funny because we're sort of bred to think about the past as barbaric and the modern way is more civilized. And when you think about child labor, it does feel a bit gross, but that's really just the spin they put on child labor because what you're really doing is taking away meaningful hands-on life experience during the age when it's most important. And to revisit uh, the quote I read at the beginning, children learn what they live. Put kids in a class and they will live out their lives in an invisible cage. I mean, what is that but a cubicle? And that really is what's behind the change there, right? It's not that the protecting children, they didn't do it for that reason. They did it to, to kind of nerf life experience for people in the young age, right? Yeah, they use child labor so that they can block kids from going into the workforce and putting them into these schools, which would give them the social foundation for a collectivist society or for a social mind, as John Dewey would say, where he said that, you know, the purpose of schooling isn't for learning or preparing you for the future, but to help you get along in this in the social aspects which really is just a uh, quite um, alarming because learning is about that expressive of the individual learning to read and write and you know pursue the interests that you have and 
the child labor, yeah, blocks kids from getting into the real world. And if you study like Thomas Edison and Benjamin Franklin and the people who achieved these great things, even in today's world, they are out in the world getting their hands dirty and trying a trial and error and learning and, and mixing with older people. And that's uh, one of the other parts of schooling is that you only get to interact with people your same age. So since if you're 10 years old and you're hanging with a bunch of 10 year olds, you have no experience to learn or to people to learn from their experience. Whereas if you're hanging out with 14 year olds or, you know, 16 year olds, they've you know, have more experience to share with you and they can prepare you for, Oh, what's going to happen next. And the, the child labor laws are ways to put kids into schools and say, well, you can't go to work. So, you know, I guess the, the best thing to do is just go to school and in there they'll learn the social policy and norms that the state wants them to learn rather than the aforementioned independent self-reliance and what Gatto calls at age 12, he said 12 year old is at the height of their intellectual resilience, their energy, their ability to deal with setbacks. So age 12 is such an important age because they have all those things going for them. But when you take that dynamic individual and you put them inside of the classroom and give them laborious, irrelevant assignments, then they realize that learning is boring. This isn't my life. And other people are going to tell me what to do with my life because, you know, this is this is the way it is. And if you went to public school, as I did, that's how I felt, too. I said, man, is this how it is? You look, look around. OK, this is how it is. And the truth is, that's not how it was in the past. In the past, it was all about letting kids out, uh, whether with the farm, uh, build homes, build boats, do whatever they can to get real world experience. And by the time they're 12, 14, like uh, Benjamin Franklin and the rest, they have businesses, multiple incomes. And they actually see that they're responsible for their life and they can create whatever they want to. Yeah. And when we're talking about kids working, I mean, work is a broad term in this sense. We're not saying we need 10 year olds selling cell phones at the mall, but when you are allowed to the work in their time was like you said, building a barn or a home or farming. I mean, those are the tools of self-reliance. Imagine being 14 years old and having erected two structures and know how to grow your own food. I mean, that puts you already ahead of some people that are 50 years old today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, today it's so alarming as well because we don't know any of that stuff. We don't know how to, you know, find water, how to become self-sufficient with planting and growing vegetables, building a shelter, building a boat, writing a song, entertaining ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're now caught up in a nationalized and even internationalized entertainment where we can't amuse ourselves. We actually depend upon the voice or sports or whatever it might be. And that's fine. You can entertain yourself. But the point is that if you don't have the choice to entertain yourself or the, uh, the inclination, now you become dependent on external sources where – the most powerful sources inside of you and also the community around you, you know, our neighbors, many people don't know their neighbors. So yeah, there's, there's this uh, growing dependence on the organism rather than the individual. Mm -hmm. And on this subject, another line that just blew my mind was something to the effect that when all this was implemented correctly, it wasn't uncommon to see individuals well into their thirties, still performing meaningless tasks and waiting to start their lives. And I mean, damn, David, being 30 myself and looking at where I was just a few years ago and then the lives of the people I grew up with, <laughs> the truth in that is so raw, it hurts. It, it really is. And I'm you know, curious to learn about your journey as well. But mine is also like I really didn't get the chance to pursue my own interests. I was maybe 27, 20. I'm 33 right now. Mm. And somebody finally said, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, I've got all this you know, 20 some years of formal education and nobody's ever asked me that question. So the 
the exciting thing is that now we can come to the reality that this is we, we can create our life. And if we can look just first of all, for me, I had to forgive a lot of people because I was so upset with the system and how yeah. they disrespected my individuality. And I was in a state of anger for a while. Amen. You're right. And so now we're in a, in a state of getting the word out. You have your media company doing a fine job and uh, helping empower people. And so now we're like, okay, we got to get productive and transmute that energy so that we can become people who take responsibility for our life and not not blame anybody, but then try to help other people cross that bridge. And it's actually really sad too. I met this lady last week. She was 22 years old, going to university out here, and not excited about it. Didn't have the fire in her eyes, and. I, and I explained to her what we're doing and the philosophy, you know, helping kids find a self-directing school or, you know, find their own passions, their own interests. So they don't have to be told what to do with their life. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me kind of concerned and she said, but, but that sounds hard. <laughs> and I said, I know it is hard, but it's harder being 40 or 50 or 60 and looking back on your life and saying, man, I didn't live. I didn't, I didn't do what I wanted to do. Right. And that's the uh, the regret that I think we all want to avoid if we become aware of it and understand that hey we can we can learn we can go forward and uh, take some risks and yeah the uh, the outcome is going to be in our hands rather than some strangers. Yeah, I've said before a midlife crisis is just when you finally wake up, but it's too late to do anything about it, and you're stuck in the job you've always had. So you just go buy a motorcycle and say screw it, but. Uh, you mentioned that when this first started to be instituted, it started off slow, just a couple of uh, s- different years, and it was only a couple months a year, and it was only through you know a certain number of ages, nine through twelve, I believe. So, when forced schooling was first instituted here, was there much resistance to it? There was, yeah, there was great resistance because parents had smelled something fishy that the promise of free education and the state being in charge and that's how they do it they actually had to take armed guards and march the kids to school with horseback because of this new law that passed and parents were very resistant to it and so after a while they you know they fell to the intimidation and um the the state power of coercion and it was not received well. And it's because there was a distrust for government in large institutions. This is in the, the 1800s and, you know, still a relatively new country. But we came from the monarchy and class system of um, the Great Britain and people wanted religious freedom. They wanted to live their life and they had been doing so for a couple of generations, running their farms, having, you know, the kids help out help out on the farms and now you have this state that comes along and says now we're going to give you free education for your benefit but we're going to force you to do it and the the parents were not receiving it and you know after a while you can coerce the people into doing it and it actually so 1852 was Massachusetts and i believe California was 18 18- 94 something like that so it didn't they didn't fall like dominoes you know like one year this one and then a year later but it took decades of constant propaganda and asserting the benefits of the the school system and yeah 30 or 40 years later finally uh the majority of of schools started to adopt it but it wasn't it wasn't uh something that the parents were excited about yeah, I think that would shock a lot of people because we just take it for granted now. And a lot of people would probably fight tooth and nail to keep it, which is just such a, a funny situation. We just we know what we know what we're familiar with and uh, the anything we're anything that's uh, unknown is scary to us. But it is important to note that this idea that people are generally dumb and can't take care of themselves might be a little more true today because of the way we've been bred in this finely tuned system, but it's not the natural state of people. The industrialists who set this up were worried about what we called earlier Yankee entrepreneurialism and what they were calling overproduction. 
And they saw all these people forging their own path as a real threat to their stranglehold. And I can't help but think that the internet has really given us a huge opportunity to reclaim what was lost, wouldn't you say? Absolutely agree with you, Greg. Overproduction, known today as overcapacity, and in conjunction with the internet, is is revolutionary. So just for some background, overproduction refers to the ability of young independent entrepreneurs to come up with products and solutions which would make other businesses obsolete. So for example, let's say, Greg, you are the manufacturer of VHS videos, and that's what you do. You have contracts. You, that's how you make your money. And then I come along with this idea for DVDs. So if you're not paying attention, my technology of DVDs will supplant your VHS business, your equipment, your staff, everything that's cr- putting food on your table will make it obsolete in a matter of years. So what we're seeing today with the internet, and I would say the app world, so many various apps that are making it convenient for people to do their business, carry out their personal tasks, is is so exciting because the internet has opened up the field for anybody with a little bit of coding experience, or sometimes you don't even need to code, but you can set up your own TV channel, which you've done on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You can set up your podcast or radio show. You can become a, a, a writer, set up a blog for free. And so with the those tools and then the distribution platforms, you can now get your word out. And I can't remember who said this uh, a few weeks ago, a well-known uh, media personality, but he said it doesn't matter where you publish your work now because if it's, if it's a value, if, if it's of interest, other people will catch on and tweet it or share it or – it doesn't really matter. The main thing is that you get out there and do it. And this is what uh, Seth Godin talks about. He has a, a great book called What to Do When It's Your Turn, in quotations. It's always your turn. Mm-hmm. And he's saying they have all these great technologies, and most people don't um, aren't using it or in terms of producing. A lot of people are consuming it, but actually creating work, creating art, because they don't realize how – revolutionary it is. So the idea of overproduction, overcapacity, could be preempted if the individual, the student, didn't even have the ability to create. So that's why you have a school system which does not promote entrepreneurialism. And isn't that interesting when we value and hail entrepreneurs as celebrities these days, you know, CEOs and founders and, you know, tech startups or whatever kind of startup you have, there's mm-hmm. a little bit of prestige behind it. But in 12 years of government funded compulsory schooling, you won't find one class. And you might in some elite public school or, you know, quote, high end public school, find something like that. But the, the, the real benefit would be coming from apprenticeships, internships actually getting out there with a master in the trade, you know, 10 years older than you or just uh, maybe five or some amount of more experience, and then you learn what they're doing. And that's that's not what they want. They want corporate employees. They want corporate consumers. And so when uh, overproduction comes to, comes, um, to conversation, we can actually produce a lot. And whether it's through media, there's some really great – great solutions out there. And, you know, that's a good point that you bring up. Yeah, man. And that was a great VHS example, because when you think of all the progress and advancements there have been, it's infinite nearly, except in the big industries that these guys were in coal, electricity, and gasoline. There's been almost zero advancements in these, in these realms when there could be a lot, you know, there's solar, wind it goes even beyond that with some uh, really crazy technologies that even i have a hard time believing exist yet there are scientists out there that say no it really does free energy is a thing we just can't break through the industries to get it to you it is unfathomable but i mean the proof is in the pudding those industries they don't change and those are the industries these guys were in charge of but 
We have talked a lot about John's work and the history here, but tell us about your own work and some of the options available for people who might see the problems, but maybe they aren't aware of these alternatives. You've mentioned a couple of them, like Summer Hill. But what are some other things going on today that make you hopeful? Yeah, thank you. This is one of the things I'm excited about because after you go down the rabbit hole with John Taylor Gatto, uh, you can t- check him out on his website. There's also a lady named Charlotte Isserbit, Anthony Sutton. As I mentioned, I was in a state of anger, and so I wanted to transmute that energy. And so the great quote from Fuller again was, you never change reality by fighting against it. You must create new models that make the old models obsolete. So I just actually had an event here in San Jose last weekend where we had proponents of unschooling, Dana Martin, uh, excuse me, Dana Martin, Dot com. We had proponents of agile learning centers.com from New York. We had the Threat Management Bodyguard Academy. And the, the models, if you want to search them, are called democratic schooling or self directed learning, homeschooling, unschooling, Montessori schooling. And that's a, a handful of solutions you can take a look at that have been around, they've been proven. And now they're starting to become more popular. And the challenge that I find is, number one, people don't know about them. So I have a YouTube channel where I've done interviews, and you can take a look there. And the other part is that parents are fearful of them because the logic is that, well, look at me. I went to public school. I turned out fine. You know, why am I going to try this, quote, different model that – you know, might damage my kid. Well, what parents should understand, and I strongly recommend they take a look, is that forced schooling, compulsory education is a new phenomenon. Just in the last 150 years has it been really implemented in the U.S. and 200 years there in Germany. Prior to compulsory attendance laws, what type of schools were there? Well, it was apprenticeships. It was Somebody who would find a cobbler or a blacksmith or a carpenter or whatever trade and ability you wanted to learn, and you would go learn under them. And then as you, you know, ventured out to the world, you would say, I studied under you know, Mr. Uh, Smith, and this is what you know, I studied under him for a year or two years. And that was how you got around and you know, got to grow your, your skills. So – the models that, of schooling that exist that are respectful inquire into the student and ask, you know, what do you want to learn? What are you interested in? And also, as Dr. Peter Gray has demonstrated, play is so important that we should associate learning with play. And for me personally, I really hated reading growing up because they assigned me all, all these boring books. But it wasn't until I was in my 20s where I discovered like books where I can choose what I want to read and mm-hmm. interests that I'm excited about. And that's when I started to become more of a reader and start to unlearn some of the habits and assumptions which uh, the school system gave me. But the the various options you can discover online, uh, you can take a look at the, the website is educationoptionsexpo.org. And the school which I started, which will be launching in the fall, is called Valor Academy, which is strictly focused on internships and apprenticeships and setting kids free to pursue their own interests and their own dreams. Mm, A noble effort. And that's funny about uh, your own background, because when I was in school, it was always the reading and writing that I gravitated to because it had the most flexibility. And I could not do math because it was so regimented, whereas... I could write an essay. If a teacher wanted a four-page essay, I got no problem doing that because I can put enough of my individuality and rebellion into there as I wanted and still come out with a good grade. And (laughs) that's like the very rare instance where I felt my individuality was actually rewarded. But it's those other subjects where there's zero flexibility where I was just like, man, screw this. Like, I, I can't take it. And so as we're kind of winding down here, You mentioned the Gates Foundation in terms of who some of the guilty parties might be today. Are there any other ones we should look at? Any other uh, organizations or individuals 
or particular foundations that we uh, should be pointing the finger at and be wary of in the modern times? I think that the Gates Foundation is one of the leading culprits just because they are, well, they're alive and present. And there's, yeah, there's a, a deep rabbit hole. Uh, I mean, it goes through the Carnegie Foundation, Rockefellers, uh, Fords, and the the finger, I think, is an important conversation because if we were tra- talking about this, in my view, to talk about solutions and to empower your listeners, and if you understand how the institution works, then rather than trying to attack these large foundations, because they have lawyers and they have their own mechanisms to resist and make it hard for people, the Achilles heel would be the attendance policy. Mm-hmm. They can remove their kids. For example, let's say tomorrow, a quarter of students were removed and put in homeschool or private school of some sort. The funding mechanism would crumble because that's how these schools are funded. So if you, if you can't pay the teachers, they're not going to go work for free, I promise. <laughs> so so rather than try to vote people in and negotiate with these foundations, I mean, these guys are set on what Paul Warburg said in, I believe it was the 50s on the Senate floor. He said, we will have a world government by conquest or by consent. And so these elite families are committed to their intentions of creating this world state where they set the rules and they tell you how to live your life and school is a mechanism to do that. So they're, they're playing hardball here, folks, and you can Mm -hmm. search UN agenda 21. And now they came out with the agenda 2030. Right. And so they're, they're really playing tough. And if, if, we think that voting in a ballot box is going to change something. It's not. And what Gatto says is that all positive improvements in human history did not come from negotiation. They came from drawing a line in the sand and saying, if you cross that line, I'm going to kill you. Right. <laughs> so, of course, we're not talking about violence here, but we're talking um, the commitment, the level of commitment that you have towards empowering your young people. And I already know you want your kids to be successful. We all want our kids to be successful. The question is, how do we go about doing that? And if force is involved, then that's not respecting their rights as a human being. And if the state is forcing you to pay for that, then you can either opt out. I mean, that's the total solution, I guess, in two words would be to opt out. And homeschool, private school, co-op, find a solution, unschool, and understand that you can learn so many things now than ever before thanks to the internet and you can go to meetup.com and find people you can really pursue your own passions now and you don't have to wait until you're 18 and you know you got this piece of paper in your hand that says you're now qualified you jump through all the hoops that's not what needs to happen now now you can be a sixth grader and write an app and sell it for fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is, yeah. and and you and these companies are looking for these top students. So in terms of the blame and the solutions, we want to take a look in the mirror, and you know you can reach out to myself, educationoptionsexpo.org, johntaylorgatto.com, and you can tell I'm working with Gatto. I'm committed to it, and. I, I just want to inform as many parents as possible about this just so they know about it. And if you can conclude that the bells and the habits formed in school are destructive to the mind of your child, then you're going to look for solutions and you're going to look for people that are in alignment with what you're doing. And you can find people on Facebook. You can find these communities that exist today in your neighborhood, at least in your community, in your city. And people do feel like you. So don't feel like you're isolated. And the I think one of the last points to give you some hope here is there's a video called The Tiny Dot by a gentleman named Larkin Rose, R-O-S-E. And he just demonstrates how the 
we outnumber these politicians so greatly. Yeah. And when, yeah. when we get divided, which they're doing now, and so if you notice, they try to put race against race, religion against religion, uh, class against class. These are all tactics used in Julius Caesar's The Gallic Wars, which talks about how you can divide a larger force by dividing it against itself. Yeah. And yeah. then they'll come to you for their approval and their rewards and, you know, badges and, you know, um, <laughs> these types of, of benefits. But we have to unite as a people and find out where we can agree. And I think natural rights, respecting human life and not forcing people to do anything, uh, especially being a classroom for 12 years, I think is a good place to start. Mm. Well said. Very awesome, David. Thanks so much, not only for doing this, but for fighting the good fight out there and dedicating yourself to this stuff. I have a ton of respect for you. Uh, you did mention some of your links. Would you like to throw out any others or remind people where they can get the book and maybe even get in touch with you if you're on like Twitter or Facebook or those kind of things? Sure. Yeah, you can search the web, educationoptionsexpo.org to find some answers. There's a free article on johntaylorgatto.com about the 10 skills for global success. And this is according to Harvard. So you can get that for free. The school, which I'll be launching, you can take a look at valoracademyworldwide.com in the fall. That will be active. Uh, I am on uh, Twitter. You can find me at DJ Rodriguez 2015 and Facebook. If you search well, the, the email address there is a little bit long. But if you, if you find John Taylor Gatto, The Underground History of American Education, go to his website. You can reach out to me. I am uh, publishing this and in communication with him. And uh, we can provide some solutions to you. We will have an event in San Jose next year. If you mention this interview with Greg, I'll let you in for free. The admission is mm. probably going to be about $35 early bird and $50 at the door. So because we're about a year away, Feel free to email me at djr at educationoptionsexpo.org, and you can get that for free. That's djr at educationoptionsexpo.org. And yeah, understand that there is a huge movement occurring, and there's a lot of positive associations and organizations out there, and I'm happy to be a resource for you. The YouTube channel is YouTube slash education options. We've interviewed top um, experts for self-directed learning and solutions to this problem. And there's a, a, a growing surge of people who want real learning for their kids. And, you know, it's programs like this that we're grateful for so we can get out and meet you and, uh, you know, attend various events and go out and spread the news about uh, these options and understand the, the weak point in the system so that we can break through and make a positive a contribution to our community and continue to grow and have great, magnificent lives ourselves and our families. Mm, you got it. And thanks for that. I appreciate, and I'm sure the listeners appreciate the generous offer. Hopefully we will see you there in about a year's time. And again, so much respect for you and John. Please let him know we're all very grateful for the things he's done too. And we hope the best for his health. Both of you take care out there. All right. Absolutely, Greg. Thanks for your work, and we'll see you next time. Continue to the, do the good stuff you're doing, sir. All right, man. Take care. Thank you, brother. Thank you. There we go, people. What a show. What a topic. I hope you enjoyed it. Big thanks to David for taking up the speaking role for John Taylor Gatto on some of these subjects. I thought he did a fine job and knew the subject pretty thoroughly. And I know so many people have written me over the last couple of years saying that putting the show aside, just watching my transition unfold pretty publicly and actually work out for me has been pretty inspiring to their own creative ventures, and people have sent me artwork, organite jewelry, statues, custom-designed longboards. The one I got had been made up into a big joint that actually lit up on one end. People have sent me socks, even, and I know I'm forgetting about a ton of stuff that has come in over the years, but I love it. I think it's great. I love seeing people trying to take their future into their own hands rather than staying in that subsubordinate trough that's dug out for them. And you need to realize how lucky you truly are. Sure, I mean, there's a lot of bullshit to cut through, but don't forget that out of all eternity, you exist within the very narrow window where the internet is still new. I was thinking about this the other day. 
how if I have kids in the next few years, by the time they're 16, all the good domains will be taken, all the good products have been dialed in and amassed an online presence already, the best podcasts are already established, all that stuff. It's like being born a few years after the California gold rush, except it's global. You exist in this time, and I think just knowing that is the universe knocking at your door with opportunity. Everyone's door, really, and some answer and some don't. But it takes less than $500 to start an online business and have a solid website up. Never in history has it been easier, but make sure you're doing everything with quality, too. The rest will kind of happen naturally, I think. I mean, that's the reason so many people prefer THC to other podcasts in this realm. I try to have constant high quality. Listeners, of course, have to judge how successful I am at that, but that is the goal. Never put out something mediocre. Somebody actually mentioned making a THC entrepreneur section on the forum so that we can support each other's ventures if we choose to, and I think that's a great idea. I'm going to try to get that up this week. It makes a lot of sense, especially in the context of this show, but it is a good episode. I think this is such a fundamental thing conspiracy advocates should know about and have a few bullet points under their belt for because its effects are so widespread. And I like it on a personal level because it's vindication for me after all the hell I went through with Holy Child in Arnold, Missouri, and again in high school at St. Pius X in Festus, Missouri. My friends and I are very lucky because we had parents who recognized that a lot of the times that we got in trouble, that it was overblown, that they used a lot of fear on us. And in some cases, had we taken it more seriously, you could say that it got into the realms of emotional or verbal abuse. I once had my desk moved into the school kitchen, and I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone, and I was told by the principal that nobody liked me, and I just caused trouble, and that people would be happier if I left. I mean, should adults be saying that to children in the 8th grade? I don't know. Another time, a girl called my friend gay, and his response was, well, you're hot. And a teacher heard that and took him into the principal's office and he got berated about how this could be sexual assault. And if he had been more impressionable, that could have been pretty traumatic too. And me and my buddies have so many stories from those days and I'm actually thankful for them now. But in the Plus Show, David also jogged my memory about something I had totally forgot and it clearly demonstrates that I didn't always rebel from authority, but in kindergarten, I had to pee and I had my hand up and the teacher was doing something else, and I had already been told a bunch of times not to talk without raising my hand, not to go anywhere without permission, so stuck between a rock and a hard place, I pissed myself, ladies and gentlemen, right in my little plastic chair, and I was fucking six. I didn't know what to do, how it all worked, but that's how worried I was about disobeying the teacher. I was in a strange environment, taken away from my family where I wasn't comfortable, And I don't want to sound all melodramatic. Like I said, I forgot it even happened until David mentioned a similar situation. But it's interesting to reflect on in this context and looking back about how we interact with authority and what it does to our psyche. Another time in high school, when they were in the process of trying to kick me out, I had to jump through a whole lot of hoops to stay in that school. They wanted me to just walk away. But I wanted to stay because my friends were there. And so they had me go through psychological counseling and also family counseling. And we went because my parents were cool and they were going through the motions so that I could stay in the school. Well, I was also a real emo little guy. And I used to write all sorts of poems and lyrics, whatever, rhyming words about dark stuff. And one day I got to the counseling session and the guy had one of those poems. I guess I left it somewhere at school completely on accident. And it looked pretty bad. I don't remember what it said. God knows. But I do remember that I had drawn a claw machine that had a bunch of human heads in it. And the claw machine was picking up a human head and dispensing it. Just a lot of angst about the factory style churn out of people and the assembly line model for society. I was really just having a lot of angst about having to eventually join up with all that because I didn't see other options. The internet was also very new still then, let's not forget, almost non-existent. And I wish I had it. I wish I still knew what it said, but probably something about life being a meaningless void and a string of unfortunate events leading to inevitably dying alone. But this situation could have gotten really bad for me 
it's funny now, but of course that little poem fueled a lot more sessions that my parents had to pay for. And had they drank the Kool-Aid a little more, they might have gotten me on antidepressants or something like that. Very lucky we didn't ever go down that road. I don't think the same thing would have happened in today's world. I really don't. And let's do this before we call it in. I still have some of the letters that were sent home to my parents framed at 30 years old. And what a great time to read one. November 8th, 2001. Now this happened after I finally made honor roll for one quarter. And I thought, wow, this is an opportunity to actually walk across the stage in front of the whole school and everyone's parents. I got to do something with it. And my dad, knowing I was going to use the opportunity, was actually cool enough to film it for me from the audience. Even though we didn't know what I was going to do, I didn't know what I was going to do. But I said, have that camera ready, Pops. And all I did after shaking the principal's hand and getting my award was I walked back to the center of the stage and sat in her chair amongst faculty looking out into the crowd instead of getting off like everyone else did. And I did the whole, oh, this way or wh where do I go? Oh, left or do I just sit here or oh, uh, <laughs> that thing. And I milked it until a teacher actually grabbed me and took me off the stage. <laughs> it was awesome. It was my uh, power line moment for goofy movie fans out there. But this is what I got sent home with. November 8th, 2001. A part of the discussion between Greg and Mr. Nolan and Mr. Zelanko on Wednesday, November 7th, included placing Greg on a behavioral probationary contract for the remainder of this school year. Greg's attention-getting and inappropriate behaviors in the recent past, including lying face down in the rain on the sidewalk at lunch and continuing to lie down during the national anthem at a football game, and now his very public and rude display of contempt for our guests, speakers, parents, faculty, and student body at the Renaissance Assembly on November 7th must stop. Hopefully, the terms of this contract will impress upon Greg that we are taking this seriously. Hopefully, our past discussions and the terms of this contract will enable Greg to reassess his chosen forms of conduct. And if he can abide by these terms, he may be allowed to stay at St. Pius X High School. If he fails to live up to these terms in a manner in which we feel is appropriate, he may be asked to leave St. Pius X High School. Number one, Greg agrees that attending St. Pius is a privilege that may be revoked for what the school authorities deem as inappropriate behavior. This can be the result of a single act or a series of acts. Number two, Greg agrees that any behavior deemed as hazing or harassing, which I didn't really do, or undermining, which I did do, in any form may be grounds for dismissal. Number three, Greg agrees to demonstrate good conduct both in and out of the classroom setting. This includes a willingness to cooperate with the teachers and the entire staff. This also includes participating in and attending extracurricular activities on and off campus. Number four, finally, Greg agrees any behavior which damages his own, his family's, or this school's reputation may be grounds for dismissal. This includes out-of-school and off-school property incidents as well. <laughs> yeah, that's the nonsense that uh, I went through. And it's all fun and games now. And yeah, I definitely did cause trouble. But it was all for the sake of trying to be an entertainer of some kind. And I didn't care about grades. I cared about opportunities for good laughs and a good story. Sometimes I was a real dick too, and there is no excuse for that. But the fact remains, I had a good idea then that school wasn't a serious place, that their authority was just an illusion, and my future wasn't going to be all that affected by what happened there. And I've been wrong a lot in this life, but I was not wrong about that. Fuck St. Pius X High School in Festus, Missouri, and fuck Holy Child in Arnold, Missouri, for good measure, too. And in the immortal words of the All-American Rejects, when you see my face, I hope it gives you hell. <laughs> so I don't know what I'll do with my own kids when I have them. I probably have a few more years to think about it, and the options are getting better all the time. My kid wouldn't even have to learn how to drive by the time they're 16, as weird as that sounds today. But to bring it back full circle, give your kids every opportunity to succeed and don't be a passive parent. Don't be and don't raise just another brick in the wall. And buy your kid a 3D printer. That's all I got to say about that. Of course, if you want to hear more, we got a lot deeper in the second hour with David. If you don't have Plus already, sign up at the HiresideChatsPlus.com and join the club to hear it. 
You also get access to the forums, all the archives, and the music that I've had made for the show, of which today we have a new one, a bit shorter than most, but Lauren Silva covered one of my favorite They Might Be Giant songs, which also probably taught me a lot when I was young. But here it is with a little higher side twist. Please review the show and share it with people if you can. A relatively non-controversial episode, maybe? These are the ones that get them hooked, right? But that is it for me this week. Your move, Fox Philanthropist, secretly sheepifying the youth of the nation. Your fucking move. They built a little empire out of some crazy garbage Called the blood of the exploited working class But they've overcome their shyness Now we're calling them your highness And the world screams Save me, THC They destroyed the bonds of friendship and respect Between the only people left Who'd even look them in the eye Now they laugh and make a fortune Off the same ones that they tortured And a world screams Save me, THC Let's look for Jesus Some will say Save me.